This film sets out to demonstrate some of the processes and features which may be found on modern shorelines, but it does not attempt to discuss their formation in detail. The crust of the earth is made of three great groups of rocks, the igneous, the metamorphic and the sedimentary. The sedimentary are secondary rocks, the materials of which have been derived from earlier rock formations by processes of weathering, transportation and deposition. A winter storm will break down the cliff itself, but as the original rocks are broken into smaller and smaller units, the energy required to move them becomes less and less. A gentle swell may sort the materials of a pebble beach. Whilst only a trickle of water will suffice to transport mica flakes. And mud will remain in suspension for very long periods. This suggests a simple scheme whereby we may classify sedimentary rocks by the energy content of their formative environments. Diagrammatically, we may show increasing energy levels vertically and decreasing grain size from left to right. We can divide the sediments into three main groups. High energy, medium energy, low energy. The high energy materials are the large and small boulders, the cobbles and the pebbles. These materials form the environments of the cliff, boulder and storm beaches. The medium energy materials are the coarse sands grading through to the fine sands, making up an environment of sandy beaches backed by wind-blown dunes. The low energy materials are the fine sands and silts which together with the clay suspensions make up the environments of the mud flats and salt marshes. Sedimentary deposits are found within river systems when they are defined as fluvial or in river mouths when they are defined as deltaic. The boundaries between land and sea are defined as the coastal areas and these merge seawards into truly marine environments. Though most of the high energy materials are of local origin, broken from the cliffs by the tremendous pounding of heavy seas, near river mouths a proportion of coarser river transported debris may sometimes be found. However, whatever the origins of the broken rock, the constant movement and pounding by the sea of smaller on larger soon smooths off corners and edges, producing the largest boulders to cobbles and to pebbles. These are then transported and sorted by the sea. Depending on the structure of the rock from which they were derived, cobbles and pebbles tend to assume flattened discoid, elongated ovoid, or spherical shapes. The perfect sphere is a rarity. Flattening or elongation causes the materials to be oriented by the transporting medium and such orientation is known as imbrication. A flattened cobble will tend to be stacked on edge against its neighbours, rather like a pack of cards, with the principal plane dipping seawards. And a storm beach consisting largely of discoid cobbles, looked at from the landward side, will exhibit a preponderance of upturned edges, the flat faces being oriented towards the sea. But imbrication occurs not only in cobble or pebble deposits, but also in sands and sandstones. However, it is most obvious when cobbles and pebbles are dominant. Once small enough to make transport easy by average seas and tide, new structures may form. And prominent here is the development of cusps. 
The origin of such structures is obscure, but they are most generally found on stretches of gently curving coastline. It seems likely that the shoreline curve itself is a stable equilibrium state which expresses the reaction between average size of the waves and the local particle size distribution. But superimposed, the crescent-shaped structures change with each tide and generally contain a whole range of grain sizes, the coarsest being deposited high at the top of the crescent. The formation of the cusp involves the erosion of material from the bed of the cusp by the backwash. Associated with the seaward erosion of material from the floor of the cusp, there is accretion or building up, where material is fanned forwards and outwards at the front of each breaking wave, and the sound of pebbles clashing in the undertow reflects the high rate of attrition and abrasion experienced by the materials of this type of environment. The pebbles themselves can often be seen bouncing above the crest of the broken water. Now, the ebb and flow of materials maintains a constant cuspate form and the undertow immediately behind the active wave fronts tends to form a gently inclined uniform surface free of cuspate indents. Above the line of active cusps are the remains of older cuspate storm beaches. Nearer the landward boundary, the spaces between the pebbles have become filled in with drifted sand and wind-blown soil. A possible site, if conditions should become favourable, of eventual cementation and lithification. A simple cycle at the site of a cliff of old red sandstone conglomerate graphically demonstrates this conservation of geological material. Today's storms have slowly undercut the old conglomerates. Jagged pieces have fallen into the sea, and subsequent tides and storms have broken them, rounded them, sorted and redeposited them. A modern high-energy storm beach, the site of a potential fossil conglomerate. The materials of the medium energy environments derive in part from the further breakdown of the pebble storm beaches, that is materials of local origin, and in part from deposits brought down by the rivers and dumped near their mouths. Such riverborne materials tend to separate. The sands being deposited in the immediate vicinity of the river mouth. The finer silts are carried further out to sea whilst the clays remain suspended for long periods. And the combined action of wind and tide transports and redeposits these materials. The clays, as muds in the most protected areas, where only the tides disturb them. The silts in slightly more exposed areas. And the coarser sands along the coastal beaches and dunes. From the air, the large volume of riverborne and sand deposits are obvious. These, when transported and redeposited as beach and dune, will exhibit many distinguishing features. For our present purpose, these features may be divided into three closely related groups. Firstly, the surface structural features. These are many forms of ripple patterns, tool markings, footprints, all patterns superimposed on a more or less homogeneous sandy matrix. Secondly, surface features which are found to derive from the sorting of materials. 
either due to differences in specific gravity or to differences in grain size. Thirdly, the internal structures, such as lamination or infillings of a buried surface structure, with materials of a different specific gravity. This last group combines features from both the previous groups, but as they lie buried, they can only be observed after careful sectioning of the beach or dune. The fossil patterns found in the sedimentary rocks are predominantly the traces left by the transporting media, water or wind. And these traces tell us something of both the forces at work and of the environment. When water drains off a gently sloping, fine, sandy bed, rule patterns may be formed. Sometimes the channels will split and rejoin in a braided pattern, or sometimes they may have a simple dendritic form. Other structures related to the flow of water, either in restricted channels or over the whole beach, are the ripple patterns. If the flow is predominantly in one direction, as on a fast ebbing tide or in a drainage channel, asymmetrical ripples will be formed, and in side view, the flow of water is seen to carry particles up the long stoss slope and to dump them over the steeper lee edge. In the shelter of the lee slope, eddy currents form, and coarser particles tend to be concentrated in the trough. The smooth surface flow of the water does not reflect the ripple form of the sand below. This mode of ripple formation causes the whole complex to move forward in the direction of the flow. And if a stable object is observed in the trough of an advancing ripple, it will be seen to be engulfed slowly, and then to emerge on the far side as a ripple waveform passes over it. Unidirectional flow of large sheets of water produces the same type of pattern, though where the water is very shallow, the tops of the ripples may be smooth and lowered by reaction with the surface of the water. And in a beach section, we again see the typical asymmetrical form. The gentle or stoss slope facing the oncoming flow and the steep lee slope facing the sea front. Coarser grains have collected in the trough. A somewhat different symmetrical ripple pattern may form at the extremes of high or low tide, where there is no overall current flow, and the gentle toing and froing forms well-rounded or oscillation ripples. But it is also true that symmetrical forms may be produced over large expanses of level, shallow water, where the waves on the surface may cause a similar toing and froing movement on the sandy floor. However, in this case, the ripples tend to have more pointed crests and longer, flattened troughs. Some beaches exhibit straight crested ripples running for long distances, but usually there is a tendency to coalesce and to diverge again. Lingoid, or tongue-shaped ripples by contrast, are restricted to drainage channels. And where the channel is broad and shallow, the tongues are rather flattened. Other more complex ripple structures will be formed where large obstacles or cross-currents have interfered with each other, or where sand of a particular grain size, perhaps cemented by algal slimes, has encouraged the formation of longitudinal ripples running parallel to the current flow. The ripples which have been seen so far have all been of a few millimetres amplitude 
and a few centimeters wavelength. But amplitude and wavelength are functions of the depth and rate of flow of the transporting medium. And in river mouths or estuaries, very large or mega ripples may be formed. These structures may have wavelengths of many meters and amplitudes of one or two meters. Mega ripples are more commonly formed, as with other current ripples, at right angles to the current flow, that is, across a river mouth as transverse mega ripples. But occasionally they may be observed parallel to the coast in the estuaries as longitudinal mega ripples. But current form patterns are not the only structures to be found in the medium energy environments. Structural patterns such as those left by heavy rains impacting on wet sand are sometimes preserved. Tool marks indicating where a stone anchored to a floating piece of seaweed has ploughed a shallow channel. or the very complex pattern left by a deceptively simple object which has rolled in shallow water. Runoff has scarred small channels to one side each time the object itself was stationary. Tracks may be seen. The strange track of a crab leading to the spot where it has buried itself in the sand. crescent-shaped feeding marks, where a shell duck has puddled for food. Fecal droppings, or even the bird itself, slowly to be buried as the sands pile up. The movement of water also sorts and grades the bedding materials, and a pebble lying in the sand causes an obstruction, and the velocity of runoff tends to be locally increased. Such locally increased velocities scar behind the pebbles, sometimes rolling them. When the water has receded, the lighter and darker sands are clearly separated, forming differentiated mineral concentrations, here in a rhomboidal pattern. At the furthest forward reach of the wave, on a gently ebbing tide, where the slope of the beach is very small, a thin concentration of lighter particles is often observed. This is known as the swash mark. And depending on the energy and rate of flow of the transporting medium, concentrations of organic materials may often be found, either highly concentrated, or mixed with a fair proportion of sand, and other small rock or shell debris. Some shells are broken down in well-defined shapes, rounded segments or lenticular slivers. Such shells lie in stable hydrodynamic positions, either at right angles or parallel with the current direction, whilst unbroken shells, such as cockles, may be concentrated and oriented with the flat, open side of the valve downwards. Areas rich in calcareous algae, such as lithothamium, provide the source for concentrations of pure calcareous fragments. These fragments, by the action of tide and storm, are further broken down, concentrated, and eventually, through the passage of time, formed into dazzling white, pure shell sands. Such deposits, because of their homogeneous composition and restricted range of component grain sizes, tend to have little internal structuring. On the other hand, where energy sorting has caused segregation of grain sizes, perhaps a sand spit laid on a finer silt, there may be very marked internal structuring and a section at the junction of large and smaller grain sizes will clearly demonstrate the laminated contact area between the coarse and finer components. The whole complex between the sea and the landward mass, that is, the beach itself, 
tends to develop a typical overall profile which seen inside section comprises a long gentle slope between high and low tides. This is defined as a foreshore. Between the foreshore and the landward mass is the backshore. The slightly raised area dividing the foreshore from the backshore is known as the berm. And if a section is cut at the top of the foreshore, it may be found to consist of the finest grained materials with a perceptible but indistinct laminar structure. The section cut in the middle of the foreshore will usually tend to a slightly coarser grained material and may be separated by heavy mineral lamina. Whilst a section cut near the lowest tide level most often exhibits the heavier strain sizes and has a coarse internal structure. The level of the water itself may be seen causing seepage at the bottom of the cut. Mineral concentrations are sometimes found outlining an earlier structure, such as this buried scar channel. Local streams may bring down heavy mineral concentrations, such as an ilmenite-rich sand. And the sorting and spreading activity of the tides will distribute the sands in clearly marked layers over wide areas of beach. A section through a beach of this type will show clearly the internal mineral laminations. In many areas such sorting and concentrating of mineral deposits has provided the basis for important economic mineral workings. Even the lightest of minerals such as mica flakes may, where a sand is rich and broken mica, be concentrated into separated layers. Here separation is due to the thin flakish shapes of the micas, ensuring that they drift easily and when settled lie oriented on the surface of the sand. But water is not the only means of transporting the medium and low energy materials. Wind is as soon as it reaches a critical velocity and the materials are dry enough will rapidly shift many tons in a short while. Overall movement is maintained by the force of the wind, but each particle moves intermittently by bounds. This bouncing movement of wind-blown sands is known as saltation. Wind-formed sedimentary structures are similar in many respects to those formed by water, ripples form, though these tend to be more widely spaced and of smaller amplitude than their water equivalent and the migration of ripples may be observed from bottom right to top left of screen. Sorting of materials into sands of differing densities. And wind shadowing will often be observed where a fine sand is protected from wind erosion by particles of shell, seaweed or rock. Scarring around obstacles with the deposition on the leeward side is common. And where brushwood or some other windbreak arrests the wind, a small migratory dune quickly forms. Once a dune plant, such as marram grass, take hold, accretion becomes more rapid. Further plant cover soon develops. More sand is blown in from the shore, piled up, and the dunes themselves become stabilized. Within the dunes, the wind direction is changeable. The drifting sand develops small hillocks between the stable marram grass tussocks.
Steep, unstable banks may slump, leaving small channels. And rill-like patterns are sometimes seen. Tool marks may be found, but these are circular rather than linear, for they are due to loose debris which has been anchored at the center and twisted by the wind. A section through a dune hillock illustrates cross bedding which is definitive of wind blown or aeolian deposits. The lowest energy environments are found in the upper reaches of estuaries. These areas are often protected not only by the coastline but also by partial enclosure across the bay by a sandy spit. The spit in the middle distance protects the area from all but the worst storms and ensures a very gentle environment. Transport of materials is almost entirely by tidal flow. Being emphasized in a speeded up record. The most striking feature of the lowest energy environment is the diversity of flora and fauna and their impact on the sediments. The inflora, the marine worms, and the tube dwelling annelids rework the sediments and tend to destroy the laminations. The epiflora, such as the gastropods and barnacles, leave behind much fossil evidence, both in the form of calcareous shells and also preserved transient marks, such as trails made across the fine muds when feeding on rich diatomaceous and algal flora. The muds are thick and glutinous but here and there will be a small rock or a piece of driftwood. Young mussels attach themselves to these and quickly colonize them. The flow of the tide is slowed down, more and more mud is deposited, and the rate of accretion accelerates. The mussel beds develop wider and wider expanses. The surrounding mud fats are cut by complex drainage systems which feed into deep ebb channels. These ebb channels are constantly migrating and in the process again rework the laminated beds. Such deeply eroded channel walls provide natural sections showing the finely laminated structure of the tidal mud flat and occasionally the shell of a bivalve such as this Maya still in its living position may be exposed. A cut section through the mud flats shows the typical intense black reducing layers which are strongly anaerobic. Worm borings bring oxygen down to the dark layers and are outlined by a lighter oxidized pattern. Nearer the shore, sand and mud are carried in with each tide. And once beyond the reach of a permanent or near permanent covering of salt water, terrestrial plant life quickly takes hold. First the algae, which bind the surface layers of silt and mud more firmly, quickly followed in succession by primitive plants such as salicornia or glasswort. And these two are succeeded by various sea grasses and other saline adapted plants of the salt marsh community. Once plants have obtained a foothold, accretion is more rapid and the flat environment of the salt marsh develops. This is a region intersected by flow channels and interspersed with pools of brackish water which have been cut off from the channels.
although the surface of the salt marsh is now protected by a consolidated plant growth, the tidal channel still consists of soft muds readily reworked by the ebb and flow of the tides. Beside the tidal channels, there may be softer patches of mud in which peculiar structures known as sand volcanoes are found. These structures are not necessarily restricted to the salt marsh environments, but they do appear to be very closely associated with the soft muds beside the flow channels, both close inshore and right out onto the mud flats. A volcano tends to form where thixotropic conditions are created the lower stable non thixotropic crust. The pressure of the rising tide or passing footfall may liquefy the thixotropic layer of brown, which will then tend to seek escape through any zone of weakness in the top silts. Occasionally a dried out eruption may be found, and if this is sectioned, a volcanic neck will be seen to lead from the thixotropic layers out through the stable layer and spread over the surface. Away from the tidal channels and in the more stable salt marsh itself lie the semi-permanent pools of brackish water. In some of them, incomplete cracks may form in the slimy mud of their beds. or where the pool itself has dried out, typical regular polygonal cracks will appear. Once a pool has permanently dried out, plant life quickly encroaches, and the most recently colonized pans can be differentiated from the general pattern of salt marsh by the darker areas of sea pearl grasses. Sometimes behind the more recent accretions is old matured salt marsh, here clearly defined by a rise of some two feet. A section cut through an exposure demonstrates the internal structure. There's considerable disorientation of the laminae by earthworms and also by plant roots. And as the section is cut deeper, the earlier structures typical of tidal flat laminations will be seen. But even in low energy environments, deposition and growth is not the invariable rule. Changes in coastal currents or other tidal disturbances may cause active erosion to develop in certain areas. The mature salt marsh will be undercut and broken and blocks of disoriented marsh sediments will become buried in newly deposited silts. Once deposited and protected from further disturbances, the sedimentary materials are affected by pressure and migrating solutions and become the sedimentary rocks. Such rocks are easily recognized by their stratification and because of this layered structure, such rocks are easily quarried. These rocks have many economic uses. Within the rocks themselves, and between successive layers, are sometimes found traces of structures that we have been looking at, fossil environmental indicators, including plants, animals, and their traces. But it must be remembered that only one in many million structures, such as we have seen in this film, will actually be preserved. And yet again, only one in many millions of those that have been preserved will ever be found to help us to interpret the origins of the rocks which we are studying. For instance, a sandstone such as this might have been laid down by water or by wind in coastal or in desert regions. But when exposed, a vertical section through the stone reveals perfect cross-bedding structures, comparing identically with those we saw earlier, cut in a modern dune. 
and even in the absence of any other evidence, this could define the rock as an aeolian or wind-blown sediment. To summarize then, the rocks deriving from the highest energy environments, the cliff, the boulder beaches and the storm beaches, will contain rounded boulders grading from meters down to centimeters. The spaces in between the high energy materials will be infilled by cemented sands. Such fossil rocks are the conglomerates and will rarely contain any organic remains. The medium energy environments will be rich in structures of inorganic origin, trace fossils and fossils of organic origin. Asymmetrical fossil ripples are perhaps the commonest. But where flow has been alternating, symmetrical oscillation ripples will be found and it may be suggested that this fossil sandstone originated in an area of very shallow water. Note the even pointed crests and the relatively wide troughs, similar to the modern examples we saw earlier in the film. Interference structures are sometimes met with. and tool marks, where some stone or other object has been dragged over the wet sands are well known. Sorting occurs on almost every beach, and here sorted mica flakes have been preserved as lenticular deposits in a fine sandstone. A passing bird has left footprints, and these may become the future's past. The claw marks of some hunting animal may suggest to the geologist how a particular rock lay with respect to the land itself. Feeding trails in the low energy muds are frequently preserved. And today's burrows of the living worm are reflected in a fossil specimen which retains not only the surface casts but the vertical deformation of the laminae by the tubes in which the prehistoric occupant itself lived. A section through today's mud flats duplicates the traces left some 300 million years ago by the forerunners of today's marine organisms which at that time were equally active. And the transient rainstorms or sun-baked droughts. These have all been recorded, reflecting moments when the rocks which you now look at were forming. All these traces provide clues to the environment in which the rocks were laid down. Today's structures may help the geologist to identify past environments and conversely, past environments may often be described with reference to modern processes. <laughs>